Welcome to the Retreat Leaders Podcast, your sanctuary with retreat experts, where we spill the tea on retreat success. Here we dive into crafting transformational guest experiences, talk about how to avoid pitfalls, and unlock marketing secrets. Whether you're a seasoned guru or a budding enthusiast, we've got the inside scoop for you. Join us as we learn how to flourish in this magical world of retreats. Welcome to the Retreat Leaders Podcast, formerly the Happy Hour Podcast. This is Shannon. I'm excited. I've got two amazing guests today, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. But welcome, Chelsea and Stina, to the show. Hi. Hello. I am, I'm going to have you each introduce yourself. So we'll start with Chelsea first. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and all that kind of fun stuff. Awesome. So my name is Chelsea. Thank you for the introduction, Shannon. I have been a nurse for the past three years. I attended my first yoga retreat last year in February with Stina. And that's where I realized I have such a love and passion for wanting to host retreats. So I am very new in the entrepreneurial and retreat hosting space. But I'm really excited to learn a lot about it and to be working with Stina on this same journey that's all started from us attending a retreat together. So I'm really looking forward to that. I currently live in Florida. I have two kids. I have a blue and gold macaw, a golden doodle, and I've been with my spouse for eight years now. And we're currently in the process of also actually getting married (laughs) <laughs> We've been engaged for about eight years, and it's just been a beautiful journey of growth together. He started a business. I went to um, nursing school. We had two kids. A lot has happened in the past eight years, and I am really looking forward to this next chapter in my life. I will also be attending a retreat uh, next month in the Bahamas with my current yoga studio here in Florida, and. I'm excited because the retreat host is also allowing me to attend at a discounted rate and to learn with her. And she's also offering me the space to host a retreat with her for next year. So I'm really excited about all the doors that are opening as I am also currently exiting my current nursing job. So really excited to be here and to learn from you, Shannon. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm so excited. And I have to say, it makes me really happy to hear that you're attending a lot of retreats to learn about hosting retreats. I can't tell you how many times I've had people talk to me about wanting to host retreats. And I'm like, great. How many have you attended? And it's like, zero. Okay. Well, that doesn't work. (laughs) You've got to go attend. And it's not because you want to copy. It's because you want to learn like what feels good to you because you are going to attract people that you want to work with. And you have to know what feels good to you, what resonates with you, what does not resonate with you. You know, and so attending retreats is so, so crucial and just learning, you know, what you like and what you don't like. So, well, welcome. And Miss Dina, could you tell us about yourself, please? Yes. So Chelsea and I met in February and every time she talks, I'm just filled with such a bursting ball of light out of my heart because we did, we stem this entire journey together, just hitting it off. But a little little bit about myself. So I've been traveling the United States as a campaign manager for the last 10 years. I've been to every state two to three times, living in hotels. And I've only just recently noticed that I've literally been leading the retreat life throughout this lifestyle for actually about 12 years or so. But Chelsea and I really got to talking about what we were really enjoying out of the retreat, what we weren't enjoying, and just our goals. We met and we were so open with one another. And it really got my mind spinning. I was working full-time at a corporate company and I was really unhappy. And what I ended up doing was I ended up quitting and I moved to Costa Rica. I spent four months in Costa Rica All of the second half of last year, I literally packed like six bikinis, flew out there, figured it out. I had gotten a full ride scholarship to school, the international yoga school, and it just changed my whole life. Throughout school, I was like, you know what, where my life is heading is not what I want. I want what I have right now. It's fitness, it's yoga, it's self-love, it's all of these things that I've been pushing since I was little. Why can't my life and my career be my life and my career, not my little side gig I do on the weekend? So that got the wheels spinning. And I ended up helping lead four retreats while I was in Costa Rica. We go through an entire retreat schooling system down there. They just taught me so much. And that's when I realized with the wealth of knowledge I have in marketing, 
I now run three businesses. A retreat company is one of them. It's really like in its infancy. So I have a retreat at the end of the year. But moreover, my background is in marketing and brand recognition and making people feel damn good about themselves. So now this is a new way to get myself out there and change the world one person from another. That's it. I love it. I love it. Well, welcome both of you guys. I'm so excited. So obviously, one of the biggest struggles Listen, the market has changed so much since I even started doing this, which has been about 12 years. And so it has changed dramatically how people sign up, what they're looking for, where they want to go, what they want to experience, where they're getting the messages from. All of that has changed so dramatically in the last 12 years. And so one of the things that hosts struggle with is marketing. And I know, Stina, you just talked about how that's one of your strengths. So tell me what you think in your mind marketing should look like for retreat hosts? I really think a strong online platform is first and foremost, making sure you have all your social medias aligned and that you're getting your reason for your retreat out there, right? Because the reason that we select a retreat is what is the benefit we can get out of it. So as long as that streamlined along with your marketing materials, I don't find that emails when it comes to retreats are really successful. Like we want that wow imagery, reels, all of that. So personally, I think that's what works best. But hey, who knows? I could be wrong. (laughs) No, that's great. It's funny because I just had a call, a podcast recording with someone else and we talked about SEO and evergreen material and all of that stuff is also super important. Social media is a beast in itself. I'm just going to tell you back when I first started, it wasn't obviously a thing. Instagram wasn't here, y'all. TikTok wasn't here. Facebook kind of was here. And so it was here, but it wasn't like that was the place to be as things are now. What I will say is people do have to be really careful about putting all their eggs in one basket. The reason why for some demographics, email is great is because it's forever yours, assuming they don't unsubscribe. Whereas social media, you could build it up and make it so beautiful and so great. And then it could be gone tomorrow for whatever reason, a glitch, you got hacked, Instagram decided to flag you and shut you down, whatever may be the case. I have seen that happen time and time again. So it's always like use the social media platform, but use it to build your clientele. So for instance, make a beautiful reel, talk about your amazing things that you're going to offer, and then include some sort of freebie so that they can capture, you can capture their information, and then you continue to nurture them. So yeah, I totally agree with you that like the wow, the pizzazz retreats definitely fill by emotional attachment and the value that they're going to gain from the imagery that you are going to post and share or testimonial, whatever may be the case. But then you do want to capture their information so you can continue to nurture that and not rely just on social. Because the other thing is, is that damn algorithm, (laughs) y'all, it changes all the time. As soon as you think you've got it handled and you're like, yeah, all of a sudden they're like, yeah, no, we don't want you to do reels now. Now we want you to do more carousels and stories. Yeah, kind of. But now we want you to do live. No, forget the live. Now we want you to do stories. And so anyway, the point is, is that the algorithm's always changing. And so you might do this gorgeous. You think it's going to go viral post and it's crickets, right? And then you do another post and you're like, fuck it. I'm like, my hair's a mess. Everything's like, it's super raw and whatever. And that one's the one that like hits all the, the buttons. You just never know. And it's never, ever, ever, even if you pay for it, going to show to all the people that you want it to show to or that you think it's going to show to. So I think having like multiple digital presence, I guess is the right word, is super important. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. So blogs, blogs are huge. Pinterest. So these two things work together, especially on SEO. Here's the thing. Think about your niche person. Who is the person you want to work with, right? That's the first thing to me. You think about who you want to work with. What is that person searching for? What are they going to type into Google, right? What are they going to type into Instagram, even the the search, the keyword? Or what are they going to type into Pinterest? What are they going to type in? Is it anxiety? Is it self-love? Is it body confidence? Is it et cetera and so forth? So finding out who they are and what they're going to search for. And then you create content for that, like be super specific, very niched. And then you continue to create content for that. And you only put it on the platforms they're going to be on. So listen, if your niche is not on Facebook, don't fuck with Facebook, right? Go to where they are. If your niche is not on TikTok, don't mess with TikTok. That's just adding more pressure and more stress on you to have to manage. So who they are, 
what do they want and where are they? And then you create content and you keep creating content for that. And you want to pull them in while you're doing it, right? So you're creating this content and they're like, oh, I really like the sound of that. And then at the end of that content, you say something like, well, subscribe to get my top five tools for X, Y, Z, or the top five things you shouldn't do, whatever may be the case. So that way they'll subscribe and you will get their email. Because I know that for the younger generation, you think that email is not important. And I get it. I'm not saying you. I'm saying the younger generation in general. People do. And I get that. But truth be told is that is the only long-term marketing that you'll own, that you can continue to nurture and you can continue to build relationships with, build confidence. So once you have put the content out there, however you do it, and then you bring them in and you capture them in, then you continue with a drip campaign, a drip campaign, feeding feeding them really valuable stuff so that they go, I want more from her or them. I want more. How do I get more? And then you're like, wow, I've got this retreat. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what I see on my end. Do you guys have any extra thoughts or offerings on what you've seen work for you as as an attendee, even as a guest? I realize attending that not everyone has structure planned and there's a lot of fly by the seat of your pants, which is great and all, but it's not always great for everybody. And I feel as though if you're spending... I don't know, Chelsea and I spent like six grand on our Costa Rica endeavor. And did everybody get out of it what we get out of it, right? Do they feel like they got a value out of every dollar that was put forth? And I would say probably not. I know that like we were like, we are getting so much out of all of this money. We were like scheduled meetings at breakfast. We were like, we're going to sit on the laptop and like chat about things. But then, you know, I don't know, maybe God just aligned us like that. But a lot of times people go on retreats and they don't actually relax until day five. And then it's day seven and they have to fly home. So I guess I'm just like having open conversation about like what I see is a lack of preparation for what a retreat can do to your life. I really feel like, I mean, maybe it's just where I'm at in New England. I'm from Boston. But I feel like you can just go and go and spend your money and say that retreat was great. Or you can go and say that retreat changed my life. And that's a huge differential. And I feel like so many companies struggle with getting that point across. And I'm so intent on not struggling and making that successful that I've been almost hush hush about what I'm doing, which is why I haven't been heavily promoting it because I want to do it right. And I want to do it awesome. And I want to do it different than everyone else. I love it. Chelsea, did you have anything to add before I I share some of my thoughts too? Yeah, um, I think that's the reason that Steen and I want to get involved more in the space that I know Steen is actively working in the retreat space. I am inching my way in there as I acquire some knowledge and uh, work on obtaining my yoga certification as well. And that's why we got so much out of our retreat experience was because we were so invested in having a a transformation, essentially. And that's why we're so passionate about hosting retreats together to provide that space for other people. I know there's a lot that Stina does with her current retreat clients, where she prepares them weeks before their retreat and offers them that support after their retreat, which I think is really unique. Because as her and I experienced at the, you know, last year in February in Costa Rica, we didn't have that support, but we did have the support of each other after we left, which made it that much more meaningful. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's really important. And that's also ties into what you said, Shannon, about who's our ideal clientele. Our ideal clientele would be people that are actually motivated to want to have a transformational experience. One thing I did want to ask you as well was what platform do you like to use to capture your client information? Is there a particular client management system that you use that you find is quite effective? Do you like to use landing pages, have website pages? Like what is the most effective for you to acquire your ideal clientele? That's a great question. I'm going to answer that. But first, I'm going to talk about one, Stina, I love that you do the pre and the post work. That is not something that a lot of retreat hosts do. Of course, it does have to be tied into exactly what you guys just said, which is who your ideal client is. So for instance, for my retreats, my retreats are not meant to be 
fully supported like that. Mine are very self-paced. Doesn't mean we don't have an agenda because we absolutely have an agenda, but my agenda has a lot of time built in for relaxation, for reset, for mindfulness. And there's no, I don't want to say there's no transformation because I think the connections that they make with each other is what's happening. But mine's not designed to be that intense. It's not designed to be life-changing, which I love, by the way. I think that's what retreat means is life-changing. Mine's probably more like adult summer camp, but all year long. (laughs) We're going to ride horses. We're going to drink wine. We're going to have some amazing meals that somebody else cooks for us. Somebody else is going to clean for you guys. We're going to have some fun workshops. And then hopefully we go home and we're a little lighter, right? And that is my ideal client, though. That's who I want to work with. Where on the flip side, it sounds like for me to you guys, you want to work with the ones who are ready to show up and do some work right? Some internal work, some transformation, some life-changing stuff. That's huge. And by the way, so very needed. So I love the fact that you, Stina specifically, and Chelsea, you're learning that you do the pre and post work. That integration work is so critical. The preparation and the integration work is so critical when you're doing that type of work. So yay, yay, yay. You've seen what you don't like and you're like, that's not how we're going to run our retreat, <laughs> which <laughs> I love. Happens. Yeah. But listen, I've done the same thing. I've attended retreats going, oh, that's not for me. But that's the whole point is finding out like, that's not for you, how you're going to do it. And that's why I'm loving that you guys are doing so much research before, because I can tell you a lot of prospective hosts, they just throw something down on paper. They think they're going to make it work and they throw it out there. And then they're super disappointed with how they feel or how the results feel because they didn't even know maybe who exactly they were wanting to work with. What do you want the result to be? Right. And so it sounds to me like you guys have that down, which is amazing. Shannon here, jumping in real quick to ask a question. Are you ready to transform your passion for retreats into a thriving success story? Of course you are. That's why you're here. Let me introduce the Retreat Leaders Playbook. I am biased, but is the ultimate guide crafted from over a decade of real life experiences by seasoned retreat hosts. This isn't just a book. It's a journey through the intricacies of creating, marketing, and selling out transformational retreats. With step-by-step guidance, the Retreat Leaders Playbook is your roadmap to a profitable retreat hosting experience. Whether you're new to the retreat scene or looking to elevate your hosting game, this playbook is designed for anyone aspiring to lead memorable and lucrative retreats. Navigate the retreat world with confidence, armed with proven strategies and insider knowledge. And there's more. If you love the playbook, you can apply the cost of the book towards our comprehensive course packed with videos, templates, sample documents, and even workshop guides. It's everything you need to host with excellence and ease. Don't just take our word for it. Retreat leaders who've used the playbook are already seeing their retreats transform from vision to sold-out sensations. Visit theretreatleadersplaybook.com to start your journey towards hosting success. The Retreat Leaders Playbook, where your retreat hosting journey begins and your dreams take flight. Learn more at theretreatleadersplaybook.com and turn your vision into reality. As far as capturing information, first of all, I do want to reiterate, Stina, what you said about social media being the first place is beautiful. Like capturing people's attention and getting them excited requires visual stimulation, period, end of story, right? And then getting them into your system. I use MailChimp and landing pages. It's not the one I'll be all. There are so many different platforms out there that you could use. That's just the one that I have used for years. If I'm being quite honest with you, just thinking about changing makes my head hurt, which is why I'm still with them. There might be better ones out there, but MailChimp for me works beautifully, right? And so you can create a landing page in MailChimp. You can create the capturing of the emails, and then you can create the drip campaign. They call it something else now. Used to be called one thing. It's changed over the years. It's called something else. I think it's called a journey, but whatever. And so you create the journey, right? So they sign up. They want your free tool. They go onto your landing page. They input their information. It automatically emails them the digital file or a a video or whatever it is that you've created for them. And then you create a drip in there, right? So then maybe two days later, it says, did you get that file? What did you think? And then maybe three days later, it sends them something else. And then maybe you have another free tool. By the way, I wanted you to have this tool. And so you do that and you're creating value for them. And the idea being that they're going to go, man, I have gotten so much already from them. I want more. So how do I get more, right? And so then... 
Maybe it's five emails later, four emails. Some people do it on the second. It doesn't matter. Whatever feels right to you and your demographic and your niche market, who you're talking to. Then you'll say, by the way, join me in Costa Rica, X, Y, Z, and you're going to get all of this and more. Mm-hmm. Right? So anyway, so that's what I use for mine. Of course, I've been doing it for a long time now. So a lot of my guests alumni. So like each of my retreats, I'm getting a lot of alumni that have been on other retreats with me and then word of mouth that grows over time too, which is just a beautiful thing. The other thing that you want to consider is, especially for new hosts, are third-party platforms. Those are great tools when you're getting started because you cannot rely, especially at the beginning, you cannot rely on one marketing tool. And I've even seen hosts Perspective hosts, they had this huge hundreds of thousands following on social media. And now they're going to dip their toes in retreats and they think that they're sell it based on their following. 99% of the time, that does not happen. It does not happen. And so you cannot rely on just one thing. You want to have like a stool with many legs so that if one of the legs doesn't work, you're still standing. <laughs> and so third party websites, knowing though that they charge a commission, right? One of my favorite ones is bookretreats.com. But just know that, you know, when something's booked through there, you're paying them a commission for that, which can be, honestly, that it could be better than spending a ton of money on advertising that you're not sure if you're getting the return because you're only paying when they book. But you want to make sure you build that commission into the pricing, right? Because then that can affect all kinds of things. And the last thing you want to do is host a retreat that you don't feel like there's a good energetic exchange for money and your time and effort and knowledge and experience, right? What thoughts do y'all have? That that is all very accurate. I've been having some conversations recently about how even if you fill out a form and you're trying to understand the people that are coming, if they're people you don't know directly, which as you grow, it'll be less people that you know, that conflict of can everyone mesh together, that would be like a challenging situation. So essentially, one of my retreats down in Costa Rica, we had an issue with a woman that just like stealing drugs, drinking, all of the absolute chaos that you don't want to deal with. And it was extremely stressful. And I just backed off because I should not be involved in a different country when I don't know, you know, the legal repercussions. And I will say that whom I dealt with dealt with it very well. But that is something you're always risking, right? So how can you prepare for that? What can you do to be mindful that that circumstance can always arise? And, you know, what do you do? How do you prepare? Yeah, you're not going to be able to prepare for every scenario. First of all, most, not all, not by any means all, but most of that can be alleviated by making sure that you're marketing to the right demographic. Sometimes what happens is retreat hosts market to everybody, which means truly you're marketing to nobody, but they try to market to everybody, which means they might attract people into their circle that they normally would not want to work with. And so I'm a big believer that you know who you want to work with and who you don't want to work with. And you craft your marketing message to that specifically. There's nothing wrong with having on your landing page or website, this retreat is for you if and having things listed. And then this retreat is not for you if and having things listed. Those things really help you narrow down the people that are going to show up at your retreat. This isn't meant to be exclusive at all or excluding whatever you want to call it. This is meant to make sure that there's alignment with you as the host and the prospective guests that are coming. So that's first of all, that usually alleviates a lot of stuff, right? Hmm. Not everything. The other thing that you want to make sure is, this is a big one, is that you have the proper waivers in your program or in your registration, and that it includes a participant agreement in there that basically says, if you do X, Y, Z, steal, lie, cheat, berate, disrespectful. I mean, it's got the whole thing, right? If you do any of these things, you will be asked to leave. And here's what will happen at that point. So you want it clearly outlined in the participant agreement on on that situation. One thing I will say is if you are hosting outside of your home country, like you were talking about, I highly recommend, and this isn't my normal, but this is only because of situations like that. I highly recommend that when someone registers, if you have not already spoken to them, that you have a video call with them before the retreat. So they register, Mm -hmm. you're hosting a retreat in another country. You then set up an appointment with this guest and you have a Zoom or whatever platform you want to use chat with them. What do you hope to get out of the retreat and get a feel? Listen, at that point, you could say, you know what? I'm feeling like I might not meet your needs and I don't want you to waste your money and your time if Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be a good fit for you. Yep. 
Well, if you do, I do that, I do do Zoom that's see, calls. yeah, you, yeah. you already do that. You do a lot, Stina, you do a lot of the pre-work and then. The, <laughs> oh, the that's because I've been where you don't do the pre-work and it sucks. <laughs> yes. So if the host will do that, you can usually eliminate most of the issues. Yeah. But at the end of the day, also just having a plan in place. What happens when things go wrong? What is right. your policy? Who's your teammate that you're going to turn to? I'm um, making sure that nothing is done by yourself. In other words, if there's an issue coming up that you get another team member with you for witnesses and for documentation purposes, all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, we live in a world, not a country. It's not one particular country, even though everybody likes to beat the U.S. up. It's a world of people that, you know, are looking for a loophole. Only. Not everyone, but there, unfortunately, there's a population that does. And so you just have to cover your own ass. It's a protection thing. It's a liability thing. And so just making sure you yeah. have those things in place. We had a really good, we have my person that runs the whole show has uh, a really good legal team. So we were prepared on all fronts, but it was new for me. So it made me think like, oh my gosh, is my contract thorough enough? What does liability cover? And, you know, it ended up opening up a lot of conversations because it's not always a rose colored glass as much as we want it to be. And I'm always one that prepares all of the bad ducks before the good one. That's just how I roll. Again, why it's taken so long for things to progress as needed. But that's good. So I was just curious. Yeah, that's awesome. That's good. Yeah, no, absolutely. And like I said, you can't prepare for everything. I have definitely had several situations. I've had to unfortunately remove guests from retreats and stuff like that. But you can't prepare for them all. All you can do is just make sure that you have a good understanding with the teammates there. I will also say is that if you have not had an actual lawyer look over your waivers, your agreements, all of that stuff, I highly recommend it. I know a lot of hosts will borrow other hosts' contracts and stuff. That may not work for you, depending upon where you're hosting, what you're providing, what you're doing, what your retreat includes and doesn't include. And the last thing you want is something like that to happen. And then they go and file some legal action against you and your waiver is worthless because it wasn't designed for your retreat. And so making right. sure that you yep. do that. It's not cheap, y'all. I'm just going to tell you right now, we just redid all of our contracts because I hadn't done them in a while. And it was almost $5,000. I mean, it, it just, mm-hmm. it's just—it's not cheap. They don't always run that high. I was doing three different ones because I have three different types of guests. And so I wanted to make sure I had one for each, including my venue. And so anyway, so we were having a complete redone of contracts. So it may not always be $5,000, but the point is, is that they're not cheap and they kind of shouldn't be, to be honest. If you're going on Upwork or Fiverr or something like that to get your contract done, you are not legally protected. That lawyer won't stand behind that document. Whereas my lawyer that I did, we already had to have an incident where the lawyer stepped in for me and it was done. He handled it because he built the contracts and he felt very confident about his work. So he was willing to do what he had to do to make sure that they were upheld right. So anyway, make sure that you don't wing that. (laughs) Yeah, it's about 3000 bucks up here starting. And that's just to read it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Um, The good news is my contracts were still fairly solid. So there wasn't a whole lot of edits that had to be done. If you're starting from scratch, it probably will be three to five thousand dollars, you know, depending upon yeah. your area and what type of retreat you're doing. But that will be the best three to five thousand dollars you've ever spent if you run into an issue, right? Because the other thing is that hosts don't realize is if you don't have a company or a corporation in the US, they're called C Corps, S Corps, LLC, et cetera. I don't know what they are on all around the world, but if you don't have that and your waiver gets challenged and they sue you, you are personally liable. They can sue you Mm -hmm. personally. So, you know, you just want to make sure that you are covered because people that come on retreat too are heavy, right? They're carrying some pain sometimes. They're carrying some heaviness and we have so much empathy. We so badly want to serve them, but sometimes that pain can be projected in destructive ways, right? And so you want to make sure that you are protected from as a business from that pain being projected at you. So I was curious about a couple things. Facebook ads, if you find that they're effective and also pricing along in your marketing. So just to share a little bit of background, I had been working with a personal development company and through them, I wanted to start hosting retreats with them. So 
offering retreats where we're incorporating some yoga, but also some personal development skills that align with the teachings of Bob Proctor and other philosophers. And the reason it didn't really work out so well that I had planned everything and then ended up canceling was because we didn't allow enough time for marketing as a team. And also, um, I think that the pricing was off. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on what do you think the ideal, I have listened to some of your previous podcasts about what the ideal price range might be. And I know it depends on who your clientele is, but what's the kind of price range that you like to stay in? And where do you find some of the best, if you've had to do this, where do you find some of the best places to host retreats at that are within a reasonable price range here in America so that it can be profitable for the hosts and also offer enough for the attendees that it's a valuable enough experience for them to want to invest in, if that makes sense. It does. I probably won't be able to answer all of that. But I will tell you that I did do an episode with Erin Haig on retreat pricing, and she is amazing. So if you go back and listen to that episode and then even reach out to her, her pricing strategy is just fabulous. Honestly, it all comes down to your value and what you are offering and if you believe in it. (laughs) This is going to be super woo-woo, but I've seen so many hosts. Listen, here at the ranch, I have seen a slew of different pricing come through for the same amount of nights. And if you're looking for like for like, same meal, same whatever, whatever, but it's a different host that's got a different voice and a different energy and they're charging three times more and sell it out. And then you've got another host that's a similar structure and they price it way, way low and they don't sell it out. And I think a lot of times what I've noticed is it's the belief in it. The fear more than anything else will hold you back more than anything else. If you put something out there and you're afraid it's not going to fill, that energy will permeate in everything you do, period, end of story. So what feels confident to you? Maybe it's not a full-blown retreat. Maybe it's a one-day retreat, right? Because that feels confident to you. And you want to build up your confidence so that when you do put something out there big, maybe it's a five or $6,000 ticket per person or whatever it is, you're going to feel good about that and you're not going to have fear around it so that it doesn't succeed the way you want. So that's what I'm going to tell you as far as pricing. It varies greatly. (laughs) There isn't necessarily a formula other than what I will say is when you're building out your pricing, you first put what you want to make. That's your first thing. And then you put all your hard costs and then you divide it by the minimum number of attendees, right? And so that varies because how much do you want to make, right? That's what it comes down to is What do you think your value is for your energy, for your time, for your knowledge, for your experience? And by the way, your energy, time, knowledge, and experience isn't just there at the retreat. How many hours and days and weeks and months did you work on it before the retreat, right? And then, you know, with Stina's program, post-retreat. So you have to take all that into consideration. But like I said, if you're worried about the confidence part, which is the most important, start small and then grow bigger wherever it gives you confidence. Also, that goes the same for start locally or where you are familiar with, right? Stina's very familiar with Costa Rica. It's a perfect place for her to host a retreat and people love Costa Rica. It's amazing. It's beautiful. The people are amazing. And so that's perfect, right? You start where you know, because that's, again, it's a confidence booster. You don't want to go have a build a retreat in Florida if you've never been and don't know anything about it. And you're going to feel out of water, literally. (laughs) So start smaller maybe and start where you know. Those are the things I can tell you. And all the other factors fall into place. By the way, one thing to note, which I know you're not doing this retreat now, but when you're involving other people's content, make sure that you have the legal right to do so. I've actually seen hosts get in trouble for that where they're using somebody else's content in their retreat and then they got in trouble, a lot of trouble. So just being mindful that if you're going to use somebody else's content that you've got permission to do that. And permission does not mean you bought the content to share it. right? So you have to make sure you have a commercial license or approvals or all that kind of stuff before you can put it into your retreat. Great questions. And what do you think about the Facebook ads as well? Oh, Facebook ads. So listen, is your demographic on Facebook, first of all? If your demographic's not on Facebook, don't do it because it doesn't make sense, right? So it just will be a waste of money for you. If your demographic is on Facebook, then yes, the ads work very good, but you got to be prepared now to spend way more money than you did five years ago, 
six years ago and for sure 10 years ago. Listen, when I first started, y'all, I could boost a post for like 10 to $20 and get magic from it. That shit does not work anymore. Kind of the rule of thumb, and this is going to scare the shit out of you, but the rule of thumb is a minimum of 50% of your highest ticket. So for instance, if your highest ticket is 3000 then plan to spend 1500 in ads. That's a minimum. Usually it's even a full ticket, right? If you're really wanting the maximum value. And so you got to build that in though. You got to build that cost in to your budgeting. And so, or again, work with what you've got, you know, pull in, work with what you got, start smaller. You can get away with a few hundred dollars if you boost an event. If you're familiar with that on business pages where you can create an event and you can boost the event, you can usually get away with like... $300 to $1,000, depends on on your ticket and where it is and all that kind of stuff. And you make sure that you're very specific in your demographics when you're creating that. But an actual ad, a full ad, it's going to take some time and some money. And it cannot be, you know, my retreats in 30 days. That's not going to work. It's kind of like SEO. It's got to take time to gain traction. And so you want a minimum of 90 days of ads, but I'm all about six to nine months. Thank you. And if you don't know, hire someone (laughs) because Facebook ads, I now have, because I spend so much on, I'm not proud of this, but because I spend so much on Facebook ads, I have my own meta representative that we have a monthly call with (laughs) to make sure that my shit's going right. But I think you have to spend a certain amount before they do that. But, you know, if you're not obviously there yet, then you can hire someone to help you get those ads right. Because the last thing you want to do is throw away even a hundred dollars, let alone 500 or a thousand or whatever. And it's going nowhere, right? Because it's not hitting the people you want it to hit. Yeah. I, the, the reason I asked was because my husband is in the marketing space and he has been for the past four years. He's started his own business there. And he's like, I should stop doing what I'm doing and just work with you on retreats. <laughs> and so I'm like, he works a lot with Facebook ads, TikTok, Instagram, and everything like that. So I was curious what your, in your opinion, if you thought that it was effective enough Absolutely. It is. It just takes a little bit of momentum, but it is. Mm-hmm. And you just have to make sure that you're advertising in the space that your client is. For instance, like I'm middle age, right? I'm middle age now. My demographic still, I still get some 20 year olds in there. They still come and hang out, but most of my demographic is middle age. Most of the people who find me, find me on Facebook. I have some that find me on Instagram, but most are on Facebook. Now my ranch, mm-hmm. because it's glamping and it's fun and it's unique. I get a lot of traction on Instagram. So you got to have to find out like the people you specifically want to work with, where are they? Mm -hmm. Where are they spending time at? I have a question about financial platforms. So a housing platform where all the payments go, output, input, all of that, right? So I had a meeting with We Travel Mm -hmm. and they said I was an unqualified candidate, which is crazy because all of my retreat companies deal with it. I had a feeling it was because it's my first one. I had other feelings. I've dealt with fit for travel as well. So I'm just curious when it's your first retreat or whenever as you grow, uh, we've had a lot of people that, you know, they do one, maybe two a year. It's very small. They just Excel spreadsheet everything. It's pretty vast. So I was curious on your input on that side of things. And then if you have a preferred platform that you use once you do start doing this more frequently. Yeah. I'm disappointed to hear We Travel declined you because they're great for the one or two or the beginning. They are a great platform for that because it's everything's built into one. So that makes it nice. If for some reason, obviously they're, I don't know if you can appeal it or whatever, but if they're not an option, the other thing is you want to have whoever's doing your website, your landing page to create a registration form with you for you. Now that you can hire on Upwork or Fiverr or whatever and have someone build that for you and just connect it to a processor like Stripe or... I have Venmo for business. Well, but you want them to... uh, I don't know if Venmo has a, a... credit card processing that can be built into a registration system, though. They might, if you have a PayPal account, I believe you can. But yeah, so however you want to do it, however you capture the money, at that point, it probably will be an Excel spreadsheet. You'll receive the registration into your email. You'll populate it into an Excel spreadsheet. This is assuming that you're just doing like one or two, like you said, or you're just starting. There are other companies out there, like I think it's FreshBooks or Honey. Or, I mean, there's some other yeah. accounting softwares out there that can do this t- kind of stuff for you and you can build contracts into it. 
and stuff like that, which might be an option as well. What I use, and it's it's a little costly, so it's usually not accessible until you're you're doing at least probably five retreats a year. It's called Retreat Guru. It's their um, retreat booking software. And I love it because it's so customizable and, you know, everything's loaded in there. I, it just, it's an amazing platform, but it's not super cheap. But to me, I say that, but it's a couple hundred bucks a month. I guess, you know, you have to kind of add that up and see what that's going to look like at the end of your year versus what your income is. But right. um, so, yeah, so we travel is who I usually recommend for the one-offs. And then, you know, if that doesn't work, then... You I know, didn't you can, look into why they said no. I, just I think gotta... you can appeal it, by the way. I've heard of that before, and then they appealed it, and then they looked further into it, and they were fine. And okay. so I think you can appeal it. Um, yeah, I didn't even – I answered like five questions, and I was like, you don't even really know that much. Why am I getting no, no? <laughs> yeah. The other thing is the, a platform like bookretreats.com, they have everything built in there. And you can actually use their platform like exclusively if you wanted to, to house all your registrations. And so – you know, everything's stored on their software. They've created everything. You could create a landing page with them. You create the registration page. You know what I mean? You, like you could create everything within their their platform as well. So, okay. um, but they're the ones that also charge a commission for every booking. So you just have to build that into your price. Cool. But yeah, I have a VA assistant that starts on June 4th for just retreats. I love I'm it. So busy with so many things that I don't even have time to personally post on any social media. Everyone thinks I've fallen off the face of the earth. So I might even get two because there's so much. That's really helpful. So my plan is always Excel spreadsheets. And then anyone who facilitates or splits, I 1099 them. And that's how it's been working so far. It's been pretty simple. Just keep track of that for tax purposes. And I've been 1099ing staff for 12 years. So that's pretty, I'm pretty accustomed. Now, I will to that. say, it's much easier though if you use like QuickBooks or something like that. The spreadsheet, okay. when I say spreadsheet, that's just for you and having accessibility to your guests. As far as the financials, I really feel like there still needs to be a financial software that can really protect you legally. If a 1099 is wrong or something goes wrong, then you've got that financial company that will back it up. But if you've been doing it for a while and it's working for you, then Maybe don't worry about changing it until you are doing several a yourself more. a year. Yeah. So you kind of have to feel it out and feel what feels right for you. Shannon here. I'm pausing for just a second to ask a big favor. Will you please pause the show and go follow us if you're not following us already? And this is a big one, y'all. This is a really big one. Could you also submit a review? We would love to see what you think of our show and also the reviews help us to get even more amazing speakers. So please take the time to do that right now. I will say though, when you capture registrations, so one of the things that people don't know is you have to capture the waiver at the same time that you capture their deposit or their payment. If you don't and you try to get a waiver from them later, they can contest that. And say, well, I paid and she, it's kind of like I bought the house and then you gave me my HOA guidelines. Yeah, that's not going to work. Does that make sense? And so whenever you're capturing their first initial payment, that first dollar, you've got to make sure you get the waiver at the same time. And there's different platforms online. Mine's built into Retreat Guru, so I don't have to worry about it. But there are some like signature capturing software that you can utilize online that's fairly inexpensive. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but if you just did a Google search, like capturing waiver signatures online, there's a ton of them. And so you can build that into your registration page. So that way you've got it. There's no question. And if something does happen, you can just, bam, it's stored right there in the software. It says the date and time that they signed it. It's perfect. Nice. Oh, yeah. Everything I have is just in a file folder because I am old. (laughs) I get it. (laughs) Listen, if you're collecting money and you're getting the hard copy from them at the same time, that's fine, too. It's uh, the whole point is however you get it, that you're getting the money. You're not getting a dollar before you get that registration or that waiver collected. They've got to come in at the same time, the initial, because if you capture any money first without that waiver, they could contest the waiver. I'm not saying they would. I'm just saying they could. Right. I have a waiver that's pretty good. It's uh with my Costa Rica people. Awesome. I'm sure it abides by all the things. Yes. And the yoga school and, you know, 
Yeah. And that's good because it's from Costa Rica and you're hosting a retreat in Costa Rica. Do you want to tell anybody about your retreat that's coming up in Costa Rica? Yes, actually. So I'm hosting October 26th through November 2nd. It's Transition and Transform in Tamarindo. So right in between the beach, but also right in between the jungle. Uh, We have surf, we have yoga, we have shopping, we have dinner, workshops. It's really about transitioning out of whatever chaos has happened throughout the year, preparing for a healthy holiday season. But more importantly, when January 1st hits, are we moving forward into success that we learned throughout our entire retreat? So it's a self-love baby. My company is Stina Lee Practice, which is SLP, but it also stands for self-love practice, which is what I'm always doing and always helping whether or not I'm teaching workshops, class, you name it. So this is the first retreat that I am hosting on my own, which I've literally been a part of them for my entire life. So it's nice to put the workbook together, have it be on my company. And it's like, I don't know, it's so funny. I'm doing these amazing projects in the same seats. I did them as a kid at like 10 years old with construction paper. (laughs) I love it. But it's for people that I'm helping and it's so lovely. So yes, please come. I love you. You can find me on Instagram. It's at I am Steenalicious because that's just the vibe I have. It's fun. It's exciting. It's pink. And we have big, beautiful hearts that we deserve to explore and grow. And that's what my retreats are all about. I love it. Well, I'm so excited for you guys and your future. I know that if you continue to follow your passion in your heart and you feel super confident, remember that confidence thing is so important. (laughs) I know you guys are going to be super successful. So thank you so much for being on the show, you guys. Oh, we are more than happy. Chelsea and I are such a beautiful ball of fun. And I'm I'm glad that she's on this journey with me. Yeah, I'm so grateful to be here. And to be on this journey with Sina, it's just been so beautiful so far. And I'm so excited to see how everything unfolds, even though I don't know what to expect. And I am completely happy with that. (laughs) We all start somewhere. So, so excited for you guys. It's not a sprint, right? It's a marathon, right? Slow and successful wins a race. Love it. (laughs) I love it. Thanks for listening to the Retreat Leaders Podcast. Learn more at www.theretreatranch.com. See you next time.